Thank you, uh, Madam President, dear Christina, uh, Secretary General Roberto, distinguished member of the uh, Parliamentary Assembly Standing Committee, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, security in our region uh, is becoming increasingly complex. Uh, we have seen uh, a uh, persistence of uh, geopolitics on the agenda. We have seen a persistence of divisions. Uh, we have seen the persistence of conflict uh, in our midst. Uh, the crisis in around Ukraine is just the latest incarnation of this uh, growing divergence in the perception of the evolution of the post-Cold War European security architecture. And there is, of course, a risk of crisis, a risk of escalation that we need to uh, address and to address very uh, seriously. Um, uh, on Monday, as I go back to Vienna, we will have a security day. A security day is an informal uh, uh, set up for uh, a discussion uh, in, in more free terms by, by participants. The security days will be devoted to the future of arms control and confidence building measures in the OSC. Uh, a, a topic and an area uh, which is creating concerns because as we face a more challenging environment, security environment in Europe, the effectiveness of the tools that we have developed over the years to address potential problems has decreased. So we need uh, to work to reinforce and uh, maybe to reinvent some uh, uh, of the instruments uh, that govern our uh, security relationships. Um, the good news is that we are having uh, quite some interest around this. We have very high partic level participation from, uh, from NATO, from the Russia Federation, from many of the participating states. Uh, but uh, the, the less good news is that there doesn't seem to be, uh, beyond, I have to say, a, a, a egregious, a very important uh, uh, German initiative that has been presented in the last few weeks uh, for, for new steps in conventional arms control, uh, but there doesn't seem to be a meeting of minds. It doesn't, there doesn't seem to be a convergence, if you want, on vision on, uh, on where to go. And that's obviously, obviously worrying. Um, uh, part of the problem we face is that uh, as the community is more divided, uh, we face challenges that are in many ways common and that need uh, common policies, common strategies. And having a divided membership, a divided community is, uh, uh, is a problem for the organization, is a problem actually for the international community. I'm coming from New York, I spent a week at the General Assembly in New York, and one of the key messages that came from uh, uh, both the debate in the General Assembly and some of the many high-level side events, like the Summit on Migration and a and number of others, was that to face uh, the new uh, transnational challenges uh, in, in an effective manner, we need a stronger unity, we need coalitions uh, within the international community, we need also new ways of, uh, uh, of operating. Uh, now, the OSC, and let's focus for a moment on the OSC, uh, the OSC is stepping up uh, to, to the job uh, when it comes to uh, geopolitics and divisions. Um, I think the response that we're given through SMM in Ukraine is, uh, is a really strong one. Uh, SMM has now become, the, I think, the biggest operation uh, in the history of the OSC. Uh, it has gone on for more than two years. We have today more than 1,000 people in Ukraine. Uh, we are engaging these days in uh, um, uh, trying to support the implementation of an agreement between the sides to disengage in three areas of the line of contact. Um, it, it, looks easy, it, it looks easy, but it isn't. Um, uh, we still face problems of access. Uh, we, uh, uh, we found that the roads the, where we, our monitors should go to patrol are heavily mined, and there are many uh, unexploded uh, uh, objects, devices uh, on those roads, so they need uh, um, uh, cleaning up. Um, at the same time, we had uh, obstacles in terms of our ability to remote monitor uh, the, the, the situation, especially at night, our monitors change uh, mode of operation to avoid security, excessive security risks, and we rely more on technical, um, on technical equipment and, uh, and remote uh, sensing and observation. But we had cameras that have been stolen, others that have been sabotaged, and the, and the wirings have been cut. Um, we had huge losses in terms of our uh, UAVs, our drones, uh, that have been repeatedly 
uh, interfered and shot down, uh, especially on the separatist side, with very sophisticated techniques. Uh, we, we faced uh, military-grade jamming that, that in some cases led to the loss of control of these systems that are very expensive. They're just to give you an idea, they cost about a million each, and a million euros each. And uh, uh, in some other cases, they've been directly targeted. We, um, uh, um, uh, in, in, in one case, we saw the picture of, a, of a, an, anti, uh, an advanced anti-aircraft system called Strela that was targeted, the SMM, and soon afterwards, the SMM disappeared from the screens. So that was a pretty straightforward connection between uh, a, a, an air defense system and the loss of, uh, and the loss of contact. Uh, 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 with, the, with the UAV, to the point that we now suspended this uh, uh, operation of these large UAVs and we're relying on smaller systems that allow us, at least uh, at a tactical level, still to continue uh, this uh, cover through, uh, through um, uh, an imagery, remote imagery system. Um, at the same time, as I was saying, we face a number of issues uh, ranging from terrorism to violent extremism, uh, cyber threats, uh, organized crime, trafficking, movements of refugees and migrants, uh, challenges to sustainable development on the long term from climate change to disasters and uh, growing economic disparities. And these challenges affect all of our countries. So there is a debate also on how to uh, uh, prepare the organization to address more effectively some of these things. And here I would like to refer to the, uh, and I heard the statement on migration um, uh, that was uh, was made uh, just before from from uh, from uh, Mr. Lombardo, from Swiss uh, Swiss delegate. Um, my point on that is that we there isn't really a debate as to whether the OSC should deal with migration issues or not, because in fact it is dealing with migration issues. And I'll, I'll give you a few facts. Um, in the Secretariat. Uh, I have, uh, uh, in the Transnational Threats Department, we are dealing with implementation of an agreed uh, concept on border management. Uh, I have a police unit that deals with smuggling of human beings. I have uh, a representative of anti-trafficking that deals with trafficking human beings. Uh, I have a, an external cooperation department that, de that deals with the partners and the discussion with the partners, the issue of migration is uh, gaining increasingly profile. Um, uh, I have an economic coordinator who is based, uh, whose uh, work is based on a decision on legal migration. So we're working on legal migration issues based on a ministerial decision. Our gender section is looking into issues uh, together with the uh, anti-traffic coordinator related to uh, uh, traffic of women. And, and of course, we're looking at the issue of children as well. Our field operations, um, including the one uh, here in Skopje, are monitoring, they are present at the border. In, in, uh, we have also open, opened a little bit of a permanent presence at the border to monitor constantly the situation there. Our institutions, ODIR is dealing with tolerance and non-discrimination. Uh, it is dealing with the human rights of refugees and the problems of social inclusion. So in fact, we do cover so many things and our broad agenda allows us to not to securitize too much the debate on, on migration, even though uh, as we deal with violent extremism and terrorism, we also look at how this may relate to migration uh, flows, but we don't really uh, connect it too directly. Uh, but we really look at every aspect, including the human dimension. That, that I think is very, is very important. The challenge is to uh, try together with the participating states to turn all these things that we do into a coherent strategy and to try to have a, a broader vision. And that's uh, where Ambassador Wild with his working group has, uh, has done a huge uh, uh, work. And I really hope that this now can materialize between now and the ministerial into a statement or a decision uh, that it's, we should have a policy framework that uh, brings coherence in all the things that we do. Otherwise, we will always uh, be dealing with this uh, piecemeal, which is obviously not, uh, uh, not ideal. Um, so dealing with these new kind of challenges, as I was saying, requires building flexible um, uh, new kinds of coalitions. Coalitions that bring together states in different ways, but also non-state actors. And so we are looking at developing strategic partnerships, uh, complementing the intergovernmental dynamics, um, mobilizing uh, resources of civil society, women, youth, religious leaders, academia, media, 
and even less traditional partners like cities and the corporate and philanthropic sectors. I'm organizing now in cooperation with the mayor of Vienna a security day for early next year with mayors to, uh, to see how mayors deal because they are the front line. They are the ones who really deal on a daily basis with some of the challenges uh, that governments sometimes struggle to, uh, uh, um, uh, to turn into, into uh, or to develop policies to address, whereas mayors have to do it. And so, in a way, uh, mayors can help governments uh, also uh, uh, shape uh, the policies that are uh, needed. In this context, the relationship with parliamentarians is even more important. And, uh, and I think, and I can only echo uh, what President Mutonen said at the beginning, that uh, there has been uh, a, a constant uh, positive development in the relations between the different parts of the OSC family. And, and with Secretary General Montella, as from his appointment, or even, even a little bit before, we started looking how to make it, uh, to make it better. I welcome, I see that in Tbilisi, uh, you also encourage them to continue in this, in this direction. And that's certainly something in which you will find uh, me, and I'm certain also the heads of the other institutions, uh, very, very responsive and very interested. Uh, strengthening the synergies, and we had a good example, the, the visit to Turkey that was uh, mentioned earlier, the director of my office was, uh, I was invited and the director of my office uh, then attended uh, the visit to Turkey. Uh, that was uh, a very useful um, uh, step, it was initiative, it was uh, appreciated by the Turkish authorities, uh, but it was found useful by all of us. Um, so I think this kind of model is something that can be uh, pursued uh, uh, further uh, in future. Elections remain for you a, a, another main uh, area of uh, observation. I'm very pleased to see that relations on this uh, with, uh, with ODIR are proceeding well. Now, looking ahead, uh, where are we going? And uh, th this is where I would come in with a few words on the budget, but I would like also to mention to you some of the structural problems that we continue facing in this organization. Uh, so the budget, we just put together uh, the budget proposal for next year. Uh, overall, uh, the, the, the proposal for the, the, the total figure for the budget is 144.5 million. So it's, a, uh, it's an increase uh, uh, over the, the previous budget by about three, 3 million, which is just over 2%, 141, uh, we're going to 144. I can, I can break it down for you if you're interested. Um, in the Secretariat, we have an increase of 2.5. The institutions uh, have smaller budgets and are more vulnerable to the uh, less uh, available extra budgetary resources that often finance their, mission, their operations have requested higher increases, 5% each. Uh, Odir and the High Commissioner, uh, over 25% the, the representative of freedom of the media, but it's a small increase, but on a, on a small budget, it looks, uh, it looks very big. For the field operations, we have a, overall a small decrease, less than 1%. This decrease, in fact, is mainly from this region, uh, in Southeast Europe. Uh, there is an increase, an increase, a proposed increase of about 4% in Central Asia, where we feel that there is a need for more assistance, more presence. And, uh, and the, the budgets uh, of the other operations, Eastern Europe and Caucasus, remain, uh, remain stable. Um, on the budget, however, I, I, I would like to repeat a point that I made already in the past, and that's the fact that beyond, as we are about to face the usual debate about uh, uh, the zero nominal growth uh, policy, um, we have... Uh, if we look at our organization, the budget has decreased over the last uh, 10 to 15 years from over 200 million to 140. At the same time, uh, while there may have been a decrease in the operations, now we are on the opposite side. We are really in increasing in all areas, but this is not reflected at all in the budgetary discussions. So we are with the resources that we have, we are, we are uh, now constrained and we are really losing uh, effectiveness of our operation for lack of resources. And I think it would be good to also take a look at the, at the, at the hard figures. Um, I, I mentioned in the past, when I, when I took my job, I was coming from Kosovo. Uh, I was head of one UN uh, um, peacekeeping operation, UMIC. My budget in UMIC was 200 million. When I came to the OSCE, the budget in the OSCE was 150 at the time. 
So uh, that, that budget of the OSC was covering secretariat, field operations, the institutions, the conference services, everything. So in fact, a single UN operation, had, uh, which was a mid-sized mid operation, had a bigger budget than the whole of the OSC. So I think it's important also not to lose sight of this. If you look at the budget of SMM in Ukraine, that mission, which is, which is a big mission, as I was saying, costs 1% uh, of the uh, UN peacekeeping budget. And uh, uh, in, in UN terms, that would be a, 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 significant, uh, a significant operation. Uh, so the OSC can do things in a way that is uh, not expensive, but there is a limit to uh, how little expensive we can be. And there are distortions. And here I will come to some of, some of the distortions and some of the problems we have. Um, one of the distortions has to do with the salaries that we pay to our staff. We are relying heavily on seconded people, and seconded people are paid only what we call the BLA. The UN pays a salary and the BLA. We pay only the BLA, and some countries uh, give uh, voluntarily some other money to the, to the staff. But so we are paying our staff one fraction of what the UN pays them. And what happened uh, over the last few months, there has been a decision to reduce that BLA by 8%. Uh, even that is a distortion because the UN reduced their own BLA by 1%, but because the composition of the parameters uh, uh, that govern our own BLA is different, uh, our countries managed to save more money on the BLA. And now I have uh, a number of missions, I have a pile of letters from head of field operations who are complaining the staff is leaving and uh, we have lots of positions that are open, uh, difficult to fill. Uh, so we really, we really have a problem if countries keep, uh, 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 keep pushing down uh, also the, the treatment of, of the staff. Also in the secretariat now, in the last three or four recruitments, I had three people who went through a whole recruitment, they got a job offered, they look at the employment conditions and they uh, didn't accept the job. Mm -hmm. uh, so increasingly I find this vis-a-vis -vis other international organizations because of course, you, if you look at the figures, you say, well, it's not too bad as a salary. But if you compare that salary with the salary for an equivalent position in uh, the UN, in the Council of Europe, in NATO, or in, I'm not even mentioning the European Union, you will see that we are the worst payer. And, and, in the end, and in the end, if you want certain skills, we don't find the people because they go elsewhere. So these are, these are concrete constraints that we have. Another problem we have is the lack of legal personality. You may be aware of that, but I would like to give you a couple of examples. Uh, not having legal, legal personality means that we have no status wherever we go as, as OSCE staff. I, I start from myself. I have, I have here an Italian diplomatic passport. With the, with the Italian diplomatic passport as an Italian ambassador, and I went to the United States, for instance, I had a diplomatic visa. Now, this visa expired. Uh, I, I went, I requested a new visa, and I was given a tourist visa because the US don't recognize the OSC as a, a, an organization with a legal basis. So in fact, I pointed out that the chairmanship asked me to moderate a debate with ministers in an informal ministerial in New York. And, uh, and I told ministers discussing this, you may, have, you may not be aware of that, but the moderator of this discussion is a tourist. It's, uh, uh, because that's my status there, that's the status of our people as they travel. Um, but this, this is a bit of a joke, but, but in fact, when you look at the implications of this for our staff on the ground, then this becomes serious. In Ukraine, for instance, we don't give legal protection to the people who are engaged on the ground in a difficult uh, peacekeeping operation. And those are your people. Those are people that you are seconding to the OSC, and we are unable to give them a proper legal protection. I think we should do better than that. And we should be able to, uh, to give them the protection that they deserve. In Ukraine, in fact, uh, as we negotiated an MOU for the mission on the Ukrainian side, this MOU went through uh, an interministerial committee. It was ratified by the RADA. It's a legal document. But on the OSC side, we don't recognize it as, an OSC, as a legal document because we don't have the capacity. That MOU was signed. It took two months for that MOU to be signed by the Ukrainians. For me, it took uh, 10 seconds. It was signed by, 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 by the tourist, by me. <laughs> and, that, and, and that's it. Uh, so in a way, it would be important to really to address this issue. 
One proposal we made is let's begin maybe with individual countries, signing agreements between individual countries and the OSC, giving legal status and trying not to politicize the discussion, which is a larger, dis a larger discussion about the charter. And of course, this then uh, ends up in the uh, bigger and more difficult debate on the role of the organization this, uh, uh, in this field. So uh, on this, I will, I will conclude. I'm sorry if I was a bit long, but I, I wanted to, to pass uh, these, these messages to you as clearly as I could. I, I hope I can count on your support, on your understanding, and the support of the Parliamentary Assembly. It will be a difficult uh, budget discussion. We have quite a few issues on the table. As you know, we have also issues on appointment of institutions that become complicated. Uh, so everything seems to become caught. Uh, in these divisions inside the organization, the budget might be a victim of that. But if I could count on your support, I think uh, uh, this may, would make things easier also for the uh, chairmanship. In fact, it will be the Austrian chairmanship who will be driving the budget process this year. And uh, so they're starting from the difficult end. Uh, but I think they deserve all the support we can give them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this insight. Um, I think uh, I would say that we as Parliamentary Assembly, we are here uh, ready to assist and to support wherever and whenever needed. Thank you very much for your work. Um, are there any comments? No? Uh, yes, one next to me. Please, Roberto. If there are no comments, sorry for taking the floor. I will take the floor then in uh, my report. But uh, as you've triggered a very interesting uh, conversation, I just wanted to make uh, one comment to thank you, of course, for including also the Parliamentary Assembly in the discussions on the legal personality. I know that Ambassador Notel and Lisa Tabassi have worked out a nice paragraph for the position of the International Secretariat. And this is very much appreciated because you also include us in this protection. Uh, you uh, indicated that you have the status of tourist uh, in one country. Uh, all these gentlemen here, ladies and gentlemen, uh, 20 of them, uh, have the status of tourists uh, in 57 participating states, uh, going to Georgia, to Kyrgyzstan, to Kazakhstan, whenever they travel, probably only with the exception of Ambassador Hotel, who has a diplomatic passport. Everybody else has the status of tourist. And uh, on the salaries, of course, I will make my uh, statement later on. but. Uh, you have described a situation which is uh, somehow difficult for you. Just bear in mind that our we look at the OSC as a target for the next five years. So what you've described as a difficult situation for us is an objective probably in the next five years after, after we've done due diligence. But I will talk about this later. Thank you. Thank you very much. There is another comment, please, from the Netherlands. Thank you. Uh Mr. President, I think it is a, a job for our own governments and especially for ourselves to convince our governments that this personality uh, issue has to be regulated. And I think when you look over here in the conference hall, a lot of colleagues are agreed that this has to be organized, this uh, issue about the personality. But few countries, uh, uh, the governments don't like this personality issue. And, uh, I think that's the problem. So I think we all have to convince our own governments to make more speed with this issue. And I think that's very important because we discussed it all over three, four years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Tevin. It's an important point, yes. Um, continuing, any more comments? No. Continuing to talk about finances, I sometimes uh, like it very much when finances are in the hands of women. In this sense, our treasurer, Doris Bonnet, you have the floor. Vielen Dank, Frau Präsidentin, liebe Christine. Die Worte uh, unseres Kollegen Sanier, die haben mir gut gefallen. Nicht nur, dass uh, wir wissen, wie hoch der, das Budget und der großen Organisation OSCD ist, uh, sondern auch, dass bei Ihnen das Budget um knapp ja, etwas mehr als zwei Prozent gestiegen ist und somit etwas höher gestiegen ist als unser Budget. Aber eines wird nochmals ganz, ganz deutlich und das hat auch und der Kollege aus den Niederlanden auf, auf den Punkt gebracht. Es liegt an uns, an den Parlament, an, wenn ich sage Regierungen, dann kann ich sagen, ja, wer sind denn die Regierungen? Das sind doch wir selbst. Wir wählen doch dann unsere Regierungen. Es liegt an uns Parlamentariern, dafür Sorge zu tragen, 
dass wir diese Organisation, wenn wir sie denn ernst nehmen, und ich habe den Eindruck, dass unsere Organisation in den letzten zwei Jahren zunehmend an Bedeutung gewonnen hat, dass wir diese dann auch bitteschön entsprechend ausstatten. Und wenn wir die UNO schon mit Riesenbeträgen ausstatten, die brauchen es auch, weil sie ja dann auch die humanitäre Hilfe vor Ort 